Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. We'll be right back to the show. But before we do, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Factor Mills. Dot com, where if you go to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50, you can get 50% off your first order. That's factormills.com slash unbroken50. If you're like me and you are a person who is busy trying to create a life, heal, work on their health, wealth, and relationships, and not to mention deal with the day-to-days of normal life, you do not have time to be going to the grocery store and trying to figure out what you're going to cook every single day of the week. In fact, one time I did the math and I realized I was spending over 15 hours a week at the grocery store and cooking. When I added factor, I got to use that time for myself, for my family, for my friends, for my community, and for my business. And so if you're in the place where you need some more support in the kitchen, head to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50 to get 50% off. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. What's up, Unbroken Nation? Hope that you're doing well wherever you are in the world today. I'm very excited to be back with you with today's episode, which is a little bit different than normal. It is actually a keynote that I did with Tom Bilyeu's Impact Theory Discord channel called Melon Minds. And it was really amazing because, as you know, I talk about impact theory pretty frequently on this show. Tom is one of my mentors and, and someone whose community I always want to give back to because I love that community as much as I love you guys, Unbroken Nation. Actually, I love you guys more, but don't tell Tom that. Um, you know, the, tr- <laughs> the, the truth is that I've been wanting to be able to share more of my keynotes here. Um, Sometimes it's hard to get them and sometimes there's legal obligations in which I can't, Um, but this is not one of those case scenarios. And what started or what was supposed to be a 45 minute keynote turned into over two hours with Q and A. And I will tell you this, this will be, I believe this is the longest podcast that I've ever posted. And over an hour and 20 minutes of this is just Q and A of me coaching. And if you've ever wondered what it's like to get coached by me, to go through what it's like to be in one of my groups with Unbroken Nation, to you know see what it's like in a deeper detail, um, this is going to be an episode that you're going to want to listen to. And it was an absolute pleasure. At the beginning of it, there was a, a little bit of an issue with the mic going, but once we got that rocking and rolling, we were off to the races. 
And it was amazing to be able to be of service and to serve people and to hear these beautiful questions and to to give to this community. You know, generally speaking, when I go do a keynote, it's like 45 minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes of Q&A, and that's, that's a wrap. And I had told um, Tom's team, Ben specifically, um, I said, dude, I'll go as long as we want to. As long as people have questions to ask, I will be here. And I would have gone all day if they wanted to keep going, but you know, it was a Saturday afternoon. And I think it's really beautiful when people show up because I'll tell you this, in the same way that those people, you, for instance, who listen to this are going to find success, it is those people who invest their time, effort, energy, or money into their lives that are going to see the greatest differentiation between where they are now and where they want to be. And, you know, I practice what I preach. Obviously, I have a coach. I spend a tremendous amount of time in personal development. I'm always trying to learn. And so for me to be able to give back is is always the thing that means the most to me. Um, and so that said, I'm very, very excited to be able to share this keynote with you, to be able to share a little bit more of the insight of what it's like when I'm on stage, um, and to also be able to share what it's like to be in a live Q&A with me. Um, and this one's a longer one, so um, I hope that you will buckle up and strap in for this because it's going to be an amazing, amazing conversation. Um, and that said, uh, please do me a favor, if you have not, uh, go and check out Impact Theory. And the reason I want you to do that is because I'll tell you this, without Impact Theory and me discovering what was Inside Quest six years ago, I promise you I would not be here with you guys today. There's no way around it. Um, and I'm very, very excited for this episode. If you're curious about more information in coaching and what I do, just go over to coaching.thinkunbroken.com. Um, and you can check out more information there. That's coaching.thinkunbroken.com. And you can join the daily six-week coaching program, which I actually built into an app that is interactive, that includes a journal, that includes questions and quizzes and education on trauma and personal development. And it's in like it's an amazing, amazing thing. It took me and the team. I have no idea how long to put that together, but um, thousands of people around the world have participated and taken that course, and um, I want to be able to share that with you too. So check out coaching.thinkunbroken.com, and you'll get a little bit more of an insight right now of what it's like to go through coaching with me when we get to that Q&A, but first, of course, the keynote. So thank you, Unbroken Nation. I'm very excited to be here with you guys today. Without further ado, let's get into the show. Hey, what's up, Unbroken Nation? Welcome to the Think Unbroken podcast. I'm your host, Michael Unbroken, and this podcast is about helping trauma survivors let go of the past, overcome their fear, discover their identity, become the hero of their own story, and ultimately to be unbroken. Our goal in company is to bring on guests and experts in the fields of mental, physical, and psychological health to help you overcome the past, to take back your power. And in this podcast, we are unedited and unfiltered, and we're going to give it to you real so that you can start to create massive change in your life. If you're curious about learning more outside the podcast, you can get a free copy of my book, Think Unbroken, at book.thinkunbroken.com. That's book.thinkunbroken.com, where you can get a copy of my number one bestselling book, Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma. The most important thing that you can ever do, my friends, is show up for yourself, and that's where you are today. And I appreciate you. I have massive gratitude for you. And without further ado, let's get into the show. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. My back. Okay. That, guys, this is life. There's always a technical difficulty. There's always something that's going to happen. There's always going to be the next thing that's interrupting our life that gets in the way that we've got to figure out how do we navigate it? How do we move through it, right? And I think that's one of the most incredible things I've come to discover about my human experience is recognizing and understanding like that next thing is coming, right? And the thing that you have to understand is everyone in this room right now has the ability to do something incredible, and that's to be the hero of your own story. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself. But before I do that, I'm going to read a quote to you from someone who's inspired and both changed my life. Decide who you want to become. Make that the center of your focus. That's from Tom Bilyeu. A few years ago, I was looking at my life and I was asking myself, who do I want to be? How do I want to show up in the world? How am I going to become the person that I know I'm capable of being? 
I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, but I'm also going to talk to you about childhood trauma and abuse and how that impacts us, how that shapes us, and how ultimately that can be the thing that stops us from being who we're capable of being and some tools for you to overcome that. I'm going to start with some stats here because I think stats will tell you more than anything I could ever tell you. In 1994, Kaiser Permanente and the California Center for Disease Control, along with Dr. Folletti, did a survey called the ACE Survey, Adverse Childhood Experiences Survey, and it was a series of 10 questions. Now, I won't go into all 10, but basically it comes down to if you had these experiences, if anyone in your family was arrested, had mental health issues, had a suicide attempt, didn't take care of you, hurt you physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, or sexually, there is an increased likelihood that you're going to suffer ramifications from those experiences. Now, according to the CDC, depending on where you fall in this category of the amount of abuse that one has suffered in their childhood can determine a ton of different outcomes in your life. In fact, depending on where you fall on the scale of this 10 questions from the ACE score, you could be up to 15 times more likely to commit suicide, four times more likely to be an alcoholic, four times more likely to inject drugs, three times more likely to be absent from work, to have serious depression, and you're two times more likely to smoke. And here's what's really interesting about this. When I found this survey, when I learned this information, it changed my life forever. See, when I was four years old, my mother, who was a drug addict and alcoholic, she actually cut off my right index finger. And I know what you're thinking. Holy shit, how could somebody's mother do that to them? See, my mother was continuation, continuating child abuse. You've probably heard that old adage, hurt people, hurt people. Well, that was true of my family. And when I was six years old, she married my stepfather, the most abusive guy you could ever imagine. He'd kick the shit out of my brothers and I and put me in the hospital multiple times. I never met my real father, but one of the greatest things ever happened to me when I was eight years old. I was lying in bed one night and I was praying. I said, God, will you bring me my real dad to save me and rescue me? And I discovered something really important in that moment. Nobody's coming to rescue you. Now, that became an amazing tool for me once I learned how to leverage it. Spent the majority of my childhood homeless and deeply in poverty. In fact, I lived with 30, three, zero different families between 8 to 12 years old. We were always living somewhere different, with strangers, with friends, with church, in a van, wherever we could sleep that night. And at 12, my grandmother adopted me. Now, you'd think that'd be a godsend, right? But I'm biracial, I'm black and white. And my grandma's an old racist white lady from a town in Tennessee you've never heard of. In fact, we had a copy of Mein Kampf on our kitchen table and my uncle's in prison in the Aryan Brotherhood as we speak. So insert identity crisis. I got high for the first time when I was 12. I got drunk at 13. And by 15, I was expelled from school for selling drugs. And I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. I was breaking into houses, stealing cars, running from the cops, getting shot at, and hurting people. And I got put into a last chance program. And I still did not graduate high school on time. And I found myself at 18 years old, looking out in the world, thinking to myself, what is the solution for this? What is the solution for poverty, for homelessness, for abuse, for pain, for suffering? And my 18-year-old brain said, it's money. So I made a declaration to myself. I said, by the time that I'm 21, I want to make $100,000 a year legally. Now, that legal part is super important because as of today, I've got family in prison for life. I've been in handcuffs multiple times, and my three childhood best friends have been murdered. Like, I knew the path I was going down. I knew what my life was going to look like, and so I said to myself, all right, go make money. But I knew I had to do that legally, and so I landed a job with a fast food joint. And at 18 years old, I had 52 people under me. I was learning leadership skills and how to read P&Ls, how to hire and fire, and how to navigate corporate America. And I can promise you I made every leadership mistake you can think of. But I knew that those skills, they had utility, and that those skills that I was learning today, those would help me in my future. And fast forward a couple years, one day I'm on MySpace, (laughs) so I'm going to age myself a little bit here. And I'm talking to one of my homies who grew up in my neighborhood, who grew up right around the corner from me, went to the same high school with me, in the same classes as me, and he had just gotten a brand new Tahoe. And I was like, man, 
how'd you get that Tahoe? Cause I'm over here thinking like, yo, he's moving serious weight over here. And he tells me something that changed my life forever. He goes, oh man, I'm working for this insurance company. Now that blew my mind because I didn't know that was a thing that you could do. The only thing I knew was buy here, pay here, unemployment lines, WIC vouchers, $7 and $10 and $25 healthcare, right? I didn't know what it was like on the other side. I only saw struggling and pain and I saw him coming up and I said to myself, oh, that's how I get there. That's how I get to that $100,000 a year. And so I made a declaration myself, that's the direction. And so I started learning more skills, how to write resumes, how to interview, how to do cover letters. And I was relentless about applying for job after job after job in the insurance field. And sure enough, as I head into 21 years old, I land a job with a Fortune 10 company, no high school diploma and no college education because I got massively clear about what I wanted. And then that thing happened to me that happens to people when they get money for the first time, and it destroyed my life. And I found myself over the next few years partying out of control, drinking, smoking, getting high, hooking up with people. My life was a disaster. And as I was heading into 26, I was 350 pounds, smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, drinking myself to sleep, cheating on my girlfriend. And that's when I put a gun in my mouth. I was done. I was like, I thought this money was supposed to solve these problems, but it doesn't, and it didn't. And the next day, I'm laying in bed. Now keep in mind, I'm 350 pounds. It's 11 o'clock in the morning. I'm smoking a joint, eating chocolate cake, and watching the CrossFit games. <laughs> like if that's not rock bottom, like I don't know what is. And so, for whatever reason, I stood up and I went and I looked at myself in the bathroom mirror. And it was the first time I'd ever looked at myself. And I remembered being eight years old. And the water company, they came and they turned our water off. But they were always turning our water off, turning our electricity off, turning off the heat in the winter. And this really incredible moment happened as my mother was asking and begging, begging the utility guy not to turn off the water. She said, I got four kids and he was just doing his job. So I get it and turned off our water. And I went in the backyard and I grabbed this little blue bucket and I walked across the street to our neighbor's house. And for the first time I stole water. And I remember being like, when I'm a grown up, this will not be my life. Now it wasn't financially because I was good but it was in every other way because I was still that hurt, lost little boy. And as I looked in that mirror, I realized for the first time I was breaking the promise I made to myself. And when I grow up, this won't be my life. And as I looked in the mirror, I asked myself the most important question I've ever asked myself. And a question that if you're willing to ask yourself will change your life forever. What are you willing to do to have the life that you want to have? And the answer, as I looked in that mirror that reverberated through my body like electricity, was no excuses, just results. And what that meant in the moment that I was not going to be the victim anymore. And you have to ask yourself, are you going to no longer be the victim? And as I thought about that, I realized I had to stop putting up with my own bullshit. I had to start taking care of myself. I had to start doing the things that I knew I needed to do. You know, every one of us has that thought, that thing that keeps us awake at night. Just pounds on us. You can't sleep. You can't think straight. It's always there in the moments of silence. It's always waiting for you to do something about it. And I decided in that moment that that thing that kept me awake at night would be the thing that I did every single day. And that's called facing fear. And in that moment, I decided to face my fear because I knew if I didn't, if I, I knew if I didn't, then on my deathbed, at that last gasp of air, that right before it's over, right before it's over, I knew the truth, that I was going to die with regret. And dying with regret is a life unlived, and I don't want that. I don't want that for me, for my people, my community. I don't want that for you. So looking in that mirror and coming to the answer of no excuses, just results, I knew I had to step up for myself. 
I had to stop smoking, stop drinking, stop cheating, stop lying, stop hurting people, start learning, start loving, start growing, start caring. And as I stood there looking at what was next in my life, I knew that I had to start doing the things that scared me the most by facing my fear, by stepping into vulnerability, by stepping into compassion and empathy. And I went to therapy. I went to men's group therapy and trauma-informed therapy and CBD and NLP and EMDR and ABC and all the acronyms. I went to everything. I went to groups. I learned. I started getting educated. I became a learner. And what happened in that is I started getting informed in trauma education. And today I have over 30 trauma-informed certifications and certificates. I still do not have a college education or a high school diploma. I started taking care of my body. I started removing the toxic people out of my life. One of the things that you have to understand is that when you start going through this journey, there are going to be people around you who don't like the you that you're becoming who want to pull you down, who want you to be the person that you were. I think Jay-Z says it best. People around me saying that I changed. Well, I didn't do all this work to stay the same. And I recognized in that, like, I had to let go of these people who were holding me back and trying to keep me as the old me. Because that's not who I wanted to be. And if I stayed that me, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. And right now, there's somebody in your life that you need to look at and have a real deep conversation with because they are keeping you from being the hero of your own story. And as I got deeper into this work, one day I was just sharing my story online. And people started reaching out to me and they started saying, hey, that thing you posted, man, that changed my life. That thing you posted, that thing you wrote, that impacted me. Hey, that podcast you made, it saved me today when I was about to take my life. And the thing that you got to understand about this, guys, I never planned on having this. But I said to myself, what if I gave back? What if when I was at my lowest, what if that when my life sucked the most, where shit was so fucking hard, I could barely stand? What if I went and been of service to other people? What if I showed up for them first? What if I created something of my life that was different than what everybody told me I was going to be? You know, here's the crazy part about life. Growing up, being this person that's told you're not good enough, you're not strong enough, you're not capable enough. Well, you start telling yourself that shit and it becomes true. And then what happens is you recognize the truth. You are in control of everything that's next. You decide the person that you want to be. But it all starts with mindset. It all starts with the way that you think. And what's really fascinating to me, especially in this personal development, and I know you guys are in here because you're learners, but I don't think people really tell you what mindset means. And you can't see it right now, but there's a giant sign in front of me that says mindset is everything. See, mindset's very simple. You see, what you think becomes what you speak. And what you speak become your actions and your actions become your reality. And some of you are being so mean to yourself that if you said that shit to me, I'd punch you in the face (laughs) and you're expecting to be successful. But think about this. You grew up and everybody's telling you, you're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You're not capable enough. And as a child, here's the truth about trauma and abuse and the things that happened to us when we're young. I don't think trauma is necessarily just the scars that we carry. I have the burn marks. I have the cutoff finger. I have the memories. But that's not the hard part. The hard part is recognizing and understanding the truth that trauma is the theft of identity. Because you see, when you're growing up, you have to understand and look at your brain's purpose. It serves one purpose. Your brain only cares about survival. Your brain only cares about you surviving long enough that you can procreate and watch your procreations procreate. That's it. It doesn't care about your dreams. It doesn't care about your goals. It doesn't give a shit about the color shirt you got on. Your brain wants you to survive. And your brain's very malleable and plastic. And so every single time that you are learning, you're adapting, and you're growing in these circumstances, and your brain is making meaning of your environment to help you be able to decipher safety in the world. And so when you're four years old, eight years old, 12 years old, and you're being inundated with violence, pain, and suffering because of who it is that you are. Because every time you try to tap into being you, there's a ramification. What happens is your brain learns to stop being you. 
because that's survival. Because the greatest thing that you could do is not be yourself because every time that you do, you suffer. And so your brain goes, well, why the fuck would I want to be me if every time I get hurt? And it adapts. And here's the crazy part about that. That serves you for a period of time. It serves you for safety. And it's an autonomic response to the stimulus in your life that keeps you in survival mode. And then you're 12, 14, 17, and you're in safety, but you bend who you are. You placate who you are for safety so that the other people around you will protect you so that you don't get ostracized from the community, so that you don't get lost in this. And then one day, what happens is you're 24, 36, 52, 75 years old, and you don't know how to say yes, and you don't know how to say no, because you've never been allowed to be you. And the Michael standing here in front of you talking with you today is a realization of the idea of the person that I thought I could be when I was willing to face the fear of becoming myself. And the only way that you're going to become yourself is by understanding that thing about mindset. You see, again, what you think becomes what you speak and what you speak become your actions and your actions become your reality. And I'm going to teach you right now the first thing that I teach people when they come into programs with me. Because if you listen to what I'm about to say and you understand truly, then it will change your life forever. You grab a pen, and this thing is mightier than the sword. It is the most powerful tool in your arsenal. Nothing is going to bring you more value in your life than you picking up a pen. And you're going to write down what I'm about to tell you. And you're going to repeat this to yourself every single day until you convince yourself that this shit is true. I am the kind of person who is kind to myself. I am the kind of person who is kind to myself. Now, why does that matter? Because if what you think becomes your actions and your actions become your reality and you operate through the scope of kindness, then in the moments in which you must face of discerning who you are and you have to make decisions about what is next in your life, you will ask yourself, what would a kind person do right now? Would a kind person show up for themselves? Would a kind person stick to their boundaries? Would a kind person say yes or no because they need to? And as you leverage that, your life will change because you will operate through kindness and that will reflect your actions and that will become the world that you live in. And in this world, you are still going to have to face fear. You are still going to have to face the truth that there's always going to be the next thing. And as you're in this, you realize like there is causation and correlation to all the actions that you take in your life. The person that you are now, if it is true, which I believe it is, that we are the sum total of all of our experiences leading up to this moment then that means that everything that's ever happened to you in your life informs who you are. And so it's not only just the abuse and trauma that informs us, but it's also our environment. It's our neighborhood, our teachers, our peers, our community, our family. Think about this when you're seven years old and you're in second grade and you sit down and you're coloring the house with the moon and the sun and the clouds and you decide, I'm going to make the sun purple. And Miss Smith comes up to you and she looks at you and she goes, what is wrong with you? The sun's not purple. And in front of the entire classroom, you're embarrassed. And that sets a precedent for you never being willing to show up for yourself because your brain has learned in that moment, ah, if I'm me, there's pain. If I'm me, there's suffering. If I'm me, there's hurt, embarrassment, shame. And then as you're an adult and you're moving through this scope of kindness and you're being you, the thing that you have to remind yourself of in order to make this actually work is that you are good enough. You are strong enough, and you are capable enough. But guess what? The truth about this shit, about your life, about the person that you want to be, is that there ain't no Disney moment, and nobody's coming to save you. If you want something in your life, you're going to have to go and earn every inch. Nobody's going to hand it to you. But the greatest thing about that is that as you go through hell to become who it is that you decide that you are, you're going to gain confidence. You're going to grow. You're going to gain skill. And ultimately, when you look in the reflection in the mirror, you're going to have this thing called pride. 
And I know a lot of you are hearing this right now and you're like, yeah, I get it. I'm following, I'm tracking. I've been trying to do the work. I've been trying to show up in my life. I'm listening to the podcast. I'm coming to Tom's shit. I'm listening to Michael right now, but my life is still a fucking disaster. Yo, I get it. It's taken me 12 years to be here with you today. Since that moment, I looked in the mirror. You're going to have to deploy massive patience to go through this process because every single day is a learning opportunity. Every single day, you're going to discover something new about yourself because you're having a human experience. You've never done this before. This moment right now, you've never been in it before. This is all brand new. And so you're going to make mistakes. You're going to fuck up. Like that's the truth of it. But can you learn from those and not destroy yourself and not beat yourself up over them, but instead say, I learned something today. And then leverage that as you move forward in your life in understanding that those lessons, those become the tools that you leverage as you go further into your life. Because again, the next thing is coming and you're sitting here. I know you're listening. You're like, okay, cool. This is making sense. It's making sense. I get it. I get it. Mindset, action, thinking, trying to create this life. But where do I begin? Where do I begin? This is the hardest question. This is the question everybody always asks me. What's step one? Step one is acknowledgement. Step one is acknowledgement, looking at and understanding the truth of life. We are not culpable for the bad things that happened to us as kids. It's not our responsibility that the people who were supposed to take care of us didn't. That's not on you. And you've got to let that go. And you've got to be willing to put that to the side. You've got to be willing to heal through that. And in that acknowledgement, recognizing that you are not culpable brings you to this moment of today and looking at your life. You've got to ask yourself that question. What am I willing to do to have the life that I want to have? And if the answer is anything less than no excuses, just results, you're going to have to get really serious with yourself. Because from this moment forward, you're out of excuses. From this moment forward, it's on you. From this moment forward, you have to understand the truth. This is your house. You own this. This is your life right here. And trauma, abuse, the past, the shit that we carry, it's like trash in your front yard. Every time you walk through your front yard, you're going to see that trash. And you didn't put it there, but it's your responsibility to pick it up. Now, I wish that wasn't true. I wish I wasn't having this conversation with you. I wish I was doing literally anything else on planet Earth right now. But I'm not, and I'm here with you. Why? Because I recognize that my trash that's sitting in my front yard comes from the generations of abuse that has led me to this place in which I had to make a decision. You see, what I do is very simple. I have one goal. I have one mission in my life, to end generational trauma in my lifetime through education and information. So another kid never has to have a story like the one I just told you. It starts with learning. That starts with having the conversation. That starts with the willingness to understand the truth that you are in control. Now, as you get deeper into this, I want you to think about something that's very important. See, people always come to me and they're like, yeah, man, I get it, but I feel so alone. There's fucking 8 billion people on planet Earth, y'all. Chances are somebody somewhere has had an experience like you have had. I'm going to talk to you about the three C's, community, connection, and commitment. See, nobody great has ever done anything on their own. You can't name them because they don't exist. We are a communal species, and by nature, we are built to be together, to grow together, to heal together, to change together. Look at this room right now. We're here together. Why? Because we want to be better. Why? Because we know if we can be the best versions of ourselves, then we can impact our community, our neighbors, our kids, our family, our partners, our church, right? We know that when we come together to be great, the world will bend itself to us instead of us bending ourselves to the world. But community is everything in this. And if you feel like you're alone, there's this fucking thing called Google and you can do this really cool thing called searching. And in that, what's amazing is that when you are looking, you will find as long as you have clarity about what you want. Community is everything. And unfortunately, some of us are in the wrong community. And you've got to take measurement of that and ask yourself, are these people serving me? Are they bringing value to my life? Am I bringing value to them? Are we in alignment? 
And that's where connection comes in. You know, you can be in the wrong community, even though you have these people in your life that you've known forever. Today, they may not be the right people. You know, I'll never forget, I was 29 years old, and I sat down with my three best friends at the time, and I told them everything that I just told you about my background. And you see, I'd known those guys for 10 years. And in five minutes, you guys know more about me than they did. And I sat down and I told them, I said, hey, I got to go on this journey. I've got to go figure out what is next in my life. And as I went through this journey, I explained it to them. One of the guys picked up his phone to check the score of the game. And in that moment, I knew I'm in the wrong community. These aren't the people to go where I need to go. And people serve us for seasons of our lives. And ultimately, it's going to be you having conversations and getting internal to find out whether or not these other people in your life are holding true to your boundaries, your character, your morals, your values. And if they're not, you have to make hard decisions. Because here's what happens. If you're in the wrong community, you're going to be in the wrong connections. And connections are everything because you need that part of people who are willing to bring you up, to hold you accountable in a healthy and sustainable way and to watch you prosper because they want to see that, because they want to see you succeed. And in return, you want the same for them. And you got to be committed. So many of us are not committed to our futures. So many of us start but never finish. And if you're willing to ask yourself, what am I willing to do to have the life that I want to have? If it's anything less than no excuses, then you're going to fail when it comes to the side of commitment. You've got to be willing to show up. You've got to be willing to face that fear. Because if you don't face the fear of showing up every day and discovering who you are, nothing will be different. Nothing will change. And yes, some days are going to be incredibly difficult. We all know this. We're living in a time right now where every day is harder than the last, but you've got to commit to showing up for you first. Because if you don't believe in yourself, who will? And you have to think about as you go deeper into this journey about the person that you want to be, about having massive clarity. Most people don't know their values. Most people don't know what they stand for. And you've heard the old adage, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And I want you to think about the values that you have in your life, about who it is that you are. I'll give you my values because some people don't know where to start. Some people have never heard this word before. And when I was 28 years old, I was figuring out something for the first time. I have no idea who I am because I was having a human experience. So I thought, what are the words that define me? Who is it that I am? Who is it that I want to be? Who is it that in 12 years, 20 years, 37 years from now, I can be if I'm willing to figure it out and have massive clarity? And as I sat down, I thought to myself, my values are honesty, kindness, leadership, self-actualization, and no excuses. And when you can figure out your values, and every one of your values should be specific to you, because those will become this beautiful filter for the way that you operate through your day-to-day -day life. So that every time something comes up that you're questioned with, that you have to decide on, in addition, you can sit and look at your values and go, okay, am I operating as the person that I believe that I am? And if you're not, then it's really easy to say no. And the greatest thing that happens when you're stepping into creating and crafting your identity as someone who has been through the turmoil of hell and you're looking at your life and going, I've never done this before. The greatest part about this entire experience is that you get to dictate who you are. And your identity will become whatever you want it to be as long as you're willing to go and look in the mirror. The greatest success that I believe people can have is that moment when you look in the mirror and you're okay with the reflection. And that means you're going to have to do the work. That means you're going to have to show up. But most importantly, that means you're going to have to ask for help. There's no shame in that. There's no shame in asking for help and raising your hand and saying, I don't get it. There's no shame in I need support because I'm figuring this thing out that has tortured me for the entirety of my life. What's really beautiful about what's next is that as you do that, again, that thing, confidence, that grows. Your impact grows. Your ability to be the hero of your own story grows. And as I sit here today, I look at and I reflect on my life about the things that I've done. And people will always ask me, well, how did you write a book? How do you have a top 100 podcast? How have you spoken in countries around the world? And it's really simple, guys. 
I made a decision about the person that I wanted to be and I committed because I was connected to the right community, right? Those three C's, those come into play. But I had massive clarity about the life that I want. And that pen, this thing we talked about earlier, this is the greatest tool because when you sit down and you define who you are, you have something to move towards. And when those moments, those moments that come up, because I assure you that they will, in which your brain reverts back to survival because it goes, you're not good enough, you're not strong enough, you're not capable enough, you need to remember that that has been groomed into you, that has been embedded into you, that has been lied into you. And today, as you're going through and you have that moment and that thought pops up, you got to shut that shit the fuck up. Because if you don't, it'll take you over. And the way that you shut that up is very simple. Again, you ask yourself that question. What would a kind person do in this moment? And if you are operating through the scope of kindness, then anything is possible, my friends. I'm going to leave you with this. Decide who you want to become. Make that the center of your focus. That's from Tom Bilyeu. And that quote impacted my life so much because it holds so true. Because when you decide and you focus, you can be the hero of your own story. And my friends, with that, you can be unbroken. Thank you. That was really good. I really enjoyed that. And reading the chat, it looked like they all enjoyed enjoyed it immensely as well. So I'm going to open it up for, for them to come on stage if they would like to. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Or if you don't want to come up on stage, put it in the event room chat and I'll take a look. But there already is a question. I'll, yeah, before I forget, there is a PO app. Uh, Kara, if you don't mind, can you repost the link? Uh, keep, a, keep an eye out for the, for the PO app link. But one question that was already asked is, if you could put a, giant, a gigantic billboard anywhere in the world, what would you put on it and why? I love that question, actually. I would put it everywhere I could. I'd make it as big as humanly possible so motherfuckers could see it from space. And it would say, though trauma may be our foundation, it is not our future. Gotcha. I like that. You know, that, so, that's the truth, man. You know, I think about this a lot. Like, you know, we, we come from these backgrounds in which we're, some of us were set up for failure, man. I'm not supposed to be here. Like, I'm telling you guys, like, it's fucking insane to me when I look at my life and the shit that I've done, right? Like, I'm, I'm supposed to be dead or in jail, like my family, like my friends. You know, if you're here right now and you got that thing in you and you're like, shit, I'm supposed to be serving. I'm supposed to be showing up. I'm, I need to write that book, that podcast, do that thing. And you're not doing it. Yo, you're fucking selfish. And I'm going to tell you why. Because that very thing that might be what you create could be the thing that saves my life, right? And I think there's so much power in being willing to raise your hand to put yourself out there and say, you know what? This is what I fucking stand for. And there's power and there's beauty in that. So if I could do that, that's what I would do. I'd make that billboard. Gigi, I brought um, Gigi on stage if you'd like to ask a question. What's up, Gigi? Uh, so I think we're on the same path, which is very interesting. And I think there is something that people don't talk about, about the care to carry. And there is something that people don't talk when they talk about trauma. And I studied it because I think that's how you start healing. I don't know. Um, everyone that goes through the same thing has kind of the same process. Um, but that's the thing, because when we grow up, um, we're very, very young. We think everything is our fault. It's like this narcissistic being. And then there are two things that we fundamentally need is safety and authenticity. And because we can't survive without a caretaker, we sacrifice authenticity for safety. So my question would be like, how did you deal with the guilt of, I was a bad kid or whatever you're telling yourself in those moments and you carry those for years, as you said. Uh, and how did you move from that? Because that's something that I don't see people covering. Because that's the thought of I'm not good enough, nothing is enough, I'm a bad person, and so on. And also the second question is like, because I had conversation with people, 
we are looking at the after picture and if there is some snapshot you before and what would you tell yourself before getting where you are now so yeah thank you Gigi. i, I love those questions you know to to answer the one about the snapshot I thought about this a lot. I wouldn't tell myself anything because I wouldn't be here. Now, now let me be clear because I also want to answer your question like a practical way. Like I would I would tell myself like continue to go forward no matter what because things get better. Right? Things do get better. I know that's a hard thing to hear especially if you're suffering. But I, I look at the world and I go, man, it's a beautiful place. There are incredible people. There's power here. There's so much love and compassion and hope. And I know it's hard to believe that because we see what's happening all the time. But, you know, I, I, traveling the world, living all these countries, speaking with people in over 80 different countries, like I've learned the truth, like people are incredible. Like we are incredible. Like there's somebody in this room right now that could change your life forever. You know what I mean? I, I, I've, when I asked for help, like everything in my life became different because I was willing to go and find those people who feel like their mission, like mine, is to be of service. And so if I did say one thing, it would be to keep going because eventually on a long enough timeline, you will find that thing that you're seeking. Now, to your first question about guilt, it took me a tremendous amount of work to be able to move through that. Because it wasn't just simply enough that I, I blame myself for the chaos of childhood because I was still thinking like, oh, the pain, the suffering, the abuse, it's my fault. But that stuff got buried in me by my mother, by my stepfather, by my grandma, by my community. You know, as I, I watched my, my mother die from an overdose, she lost both her legs. She was hospitalized from drugs. Like she destroyed her life. And I felt guilty about that for a period of time because I was like, I couldn't save her. And I had to take her out of my life because, again, you're talking about this idea of the, the people who can impact you. And I knew that if she stayed in my life, like I wasn't going to be here talking to you today. And so that guilt about that moment of being at 18 years old and making literally the hardest decision I've ever fucking made, that carried weight for me for a very long time until I realized the truth. That if I didn't take care of myself and put myself first, I was never going to be able to be the man I was capable of being. And so the actual practical way is to like let go of that guilt. Like So th there's one of the things that I was really powerful for me was just journaling. And so actually I still have them. There are four different colored journals on my desk. And there's a red one. And that red one's for anger. And when I'm pissed and I'm mad at the world and I'm mad at my parents and my community and everything that I went through in those rare moments when it even comes, I get in that thing and I write my feelings. But in the beginning of the healing and recovering, what I did was I wrote everything that I was mad at and it helped me remove it. Because if you think about this, if you carry guilt, it's like carrying a backpack full of bricks. And it's like, how long are you going to carry that backpack? Like, how long are you going to carry that shit? Because it's heavy, and it sucks, and it's unfair, and it's not your responsibility. And so if you can put yourself in this position in which you're willing to go and seek guidance and help and somebody to guide you through that process, then what happens is day by day, you take a brick out, you take a brick out, you take a brick out, and eventually you lay that bag down and you move forward in your life. Because guilt doesn't serve you about things that aren't your fault. And I think that the greatest thing that you can do in a very practical sense is go and seek professional guidance on this. Because if you keep trying to do this alone, nothing's going to change. I agree so much. And yeah, man, if people would journal, like that's, I, I was against it and so resistance and I started journaling and it's, it changed my life. So I can also agree with that. Um, yeah, and also asking for help. Like, I heard this, and yeah, it's like everything you need to learn, you learn by the age of two. It's asking for help, being kind, saying thank you, saying good morning, and you know, like that's all you need in life. So you know, but yeah, I hope I hope to see your progress because I know you're not done, and it's so inspiring. And yeah, let's get in touch and see how can, we can also help each other maybe do something yeah, with the community absolutely. or something like that. Yeah, yeah I, I, and you, 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 
need to stop saying I shouldn't be here and you need to say I should be here because you know the chance of any of us to be born is one in 400 trillion so I wake up with that thought every day and I'm like I'm winning in life so you know you're supposed to be here you're supposed to do this you deserve it so yeah big shout out to you so thank you Absolutely, my friend. And thank you. And thank you for being here. Be And thank all of you for being here, because that makes you all a part of my mission. And that that means the world to me. And, and, you know, it's really funny, because we're in this amazing collective of people who they want betterment in their life. And I, I think that when we come together more and more, we're going to change the world together. So thank you for being here. Hey, got somebody else who would like to uh, come up on stage. But before that, um, I just brought them up. I have a question as well. Someone wants to know, Fast and Curious wants to know, what's the secret to your speaking? Is it talking in large groups or is it repetition? Um, great question. So my, my secret to speaking is relentlessly doing it all of the time. It is me practicing in my head 8 million times before I get on stage. It is... Like, I'll, I'll tell you kind of like the background. So when I was a little kid, I wanted to be Jay-Z or the Foo Fighters. Like, I just always wanted to be a rock star. And uh, and and so I played in band and I, 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 I rapped and stuff like that as a kid. But it was never going to happen for me because I never put in real effort, right? And and when I decided to get serious about mentorship and coaching and, and helping people, what I did was I, I asked myself, what is the hardest form of public speaking? And I was like, oh, it's stand-up comedy. And so I actually broke my teeth, like cut my teeth speaking by doing stand-up. And I would go in rooms of two people and seven people and 12 people. And this was years. I mean, I started doing stand-up like eight years ago. And it was about trying to be as uncomfortable as humanly possible. And then it turned into, um, I'm going to go and learn from Toastmasters, right? I've done Toastmasters, I think, in eight different countries as I've traveled. Um, I've had speaking coaches. I've gone to speaking events. I've listened to great speakers. Like, I don't know what, like, my some of my favorite speakers in, in the world, we all kind of have the same thing in common. It's like, we just rinse and repeat this. And I've spoken in rooms of four people and as many as 10,000 people. You know, last year I spoke in front of Grant Cardone's um, 10X boot camp, and there was 10,000 people there. I could have never done that without all the hundreds and hundreds of times where one person watched or two or four or nobody showed up to the events or it was me and literally in the mirror, like m going through the process. I mean, even this morning when I'm at the gym before I came on with you guys in the gym, I'm rehearsing what I'm going to talk about. So it's about just doing it ad nauseum again, but it's the same thing as anything, guys. You got, you got to think about this. The first time you've ever done anything in your life, you sucked. Like I was so bad at the beginning of this, right? And now we're we're heading almost to a decade and I just feel like I'm starting to understand how to do it. And I, I think it's going to be another decade before I'm very proficient at it. So it's just about showing up every day and putting in the reps. I love that answer. Got to put in the reps every day. Um, Oniro, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Thanks. Hi, Michael. Uh, my name is Oniro. I'm just being a meme right now. Um, but uh, I love your talk. It's, it's super poetic and very, very beautiful and inspiring. Um, your story is just amazing. Um, the question I wanted to ask you, I just wanted to ask first, can you guys hear me just fine? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, I wanted to ask about... Uh, seeking professional help, right? That's something people do a lot of the time in a time of crisis or like when they're at a low. Um, and I don't know if it's just the way health networks are, work or however, but I, I think a lot of people end up having a similar experience, like people that I've talked to where they reach out for help um, and they encounter a system that's really difficult for them to find a therapist or find someone to talk to. Um, and a lot of them get demoralized um, and they actually do need the help. They kind of just put it off because they're busy and it's really difficult. And it seems like this thing that kind of hangs over them. And I'm wondering if you 
you have any advice for how to like get get out of that? Yeah, great question. Um, I actually I ran into the same issue um, probably about ten years ago, and so a, a couple of things happened because like it's not hyperbole when I'm when I ask myself what am I willing to do when I say no excuses just results like I mean it and and a big part of what that means is being solution oriented right and and when I say solution oriented it's this there's always going to be the problem there always is going to be that thing in front of you that is going to stop you from getting what you want and you've got to be willing to navigate and find the other way to get that thing that you desire. Because when you do that, that's the only way you're ultimately going to find success, right? And so the, the thing that I always think about here is going back and navigating to the beginning of this journey, um, my insurance would not cover therapy. Um, I just, I had state insurance. It wasn't that good. I wasn't really making money at the time because I'd quit my corporate job and it was starting my first business. And I was just kind of figuring out shit on the fly. And I decided I'm just going to sell some stuff. I got, I got like, all like, I had an Xbox and I had all these video games and Blu-rays, like aging myself. You know what a Blu-ray is? Like, I think I'm getting old. But anyway, so I decided, I was like, yeah, I'm just going to sell all my shit. Right. Because like, it's, what do you want? Because there's always going to be a reason why you can make an excuse. You're always going to be busy. There's always the next thing that's going to take your time. And so I started finding people who would do sliding scale payments, which I would come in. I find a therapist of like, Hey, you know, um, do you do sliding scale? Which means that they will adjust their rate depending on what you can afford at the time. And that's actually how I started. And that's how I did like EMDR. That's how I did CBT cognitive behavioral therapy, because I mean, that shit's expensive and my insurance wouldn't cover over it. And once I got a little bit, once I had insurance and, you know, I was able, cause I was making more money and so on and so forth. I was like, Oh, I want to work with somebody very specific and specialized because I felt like one of the issues that I ran into the most was it's twofold. And this is not to be crass. I promise you, but running into therapists who I felt like were not on my level intellectually in terms of understanding the impact of abuse. And so you'd sit with people and they would you know, they never had the experiences. So it was kind of like talking to a wall because they couldn't rebuttal or retort or actually help me. So I got really clear about wanting to be with a, a therapist who had actually had traumatic experiences. Cause I think there's something about, and this is again, my personal opinion. I think there's something about that connection in which it allowed me to let my guard down and be vulnerable in that space. So I could actually heal because any other time I'd be with therapists, I just tell them whatever I thought they wanted to hear. Cause it made me feel good about myself, which is like the biggest fucking waste of money on planet earth. But that felt true to me when I got to this place where I was like, okay, cool. I want to be with a therapist only who has had traumatic experiences and come through the other side. And so what happened was I literally created a spreadsheet and I went on psychology.com and I Googled therapists that were trauma informed and educated, which it wasn't as common eight, nine years ago as it is today. And so I made a spreadsheet. I put all their names on it, all their phone numbers on it. And then I created a series of like 10 questions and I went through it like a job interview where I got on the phone with every single one of these people and I asked them questions to determine whether or not they were gonna be the right fit for me. I think one of the unfortunate things about the conversation around professional help when it comes to therapy and psychotherapy is that we're often told, well, just talk to someone. And I agree, yes, to an extent that is beneficial, but I found that it wasn't as beneficial as talking to someone specific about exactly what I was seeking guidance on. And so I think if you can get massive clarity like that, you'll have, and, and today my therapist has been my therapist for an incredibly long time because he is a person that went through the experiences that I had and I, very similar, I should say, and I, I felt like I could trust him, which especially, and I'll speak to being a man because I am one. That's one of the things that we struggle with the most is having the space of understanding, like we're told when we're growing up, don't cry, man up, 
you know, all of these things. And then to be vulnerable feels almost impossible. So I knew if I could connect with a man who had traumatic experience, who was a professional, who had, you know, changed their life as well, I was going to actually be able to grow. And that has held true. And so in the beginning, you know, especially if you don't have money, you know, you have to ask yourself, like, how can I make this happen? You, uh, one of the things I love Gary Vee always says, he's like, you probably have like $5,000 worth of shit in your house you can sell. Right. And so that's kind of what I did. I just sold a whole bunch of stuff until I got insurance and then I found the right person. So, um, and now also you have better help. You have all these apps, you have the ability to do this at such a more affordable rate. Um, you know, you, you often, we just have to sacrifice and you've got to be very pointed and say, all right, I'm just not going to go to Starbucks. Cause that costs me $95 a month. But this therapy session that I could do once a month that would change my life is $95. Well, then you got to ask yourself, what do you really want here? So I, I hope that's helpful. No, that's, that's super helpful. I, you, you walked through a lot and there's a lot of nuance there and, and all of that was like super rich and, and valuable. And I think what you just touched base on, like the, the last part of it was priorities and, and uh, not making excuses. And I think that is super important. And if something's hanging over, you know, someone's head like that, they, you know, part of the solution a lot of the times is, is to, to make it happen. And it might require some, some cuts you don't want to make and some some sacrifices but at the end of the day if, if that is what's important and in a lot of cases it is then then you gotta you gotta make room for that so that's that's really smart um there's one other part of what you said that i wanted to talk about oh yeah um finding a therapist that is connects with your issues directly i think that's super super important too like i've had i had like four or five therapists for my current one. And the, the difference to me is like uh, unfathomably different. It's like those people were just like interesting people to kind of like work through problems with. And like some of them were, you know, better than others at like kind of problem solving. But I mean, I, I'm actually like on the autism spectrum, like a little Asperger's and my therapist is uh, also autistic and she understands all like the nuances of how to deal with that and like what kinds of little emotions come up and like it's just like it's, it's honestly been such a more fruitful relationship so i think that's really smart that you know you get the advice to kind of like really look at what you're going after and, and develop an interview process yourself you know to ask them you know what and then find out from them you know what they're capable of and make sure it's a good fit so yeah, all, all really super, super good things that you said, and, and I appreciate your answer. Yeah, man. And I, and I appreciate you being here and thank you so much. And I'm, I'm glad you've found the right support that you need for your journey, man. That's, that's absolutely amazing. Uh, Tort, I know we're running out of time, man, but I'll, I'll take as many questions as want to be asked. So, um, I say, let's keep rolling, brother. Yep. We don't have to worry about a time limit. You are more than welcome to stay as long as you'd like. Let's go. So I had a question from myself that I was curious about. So you made the decision, you set your mind, you knew your intentions, but of course, along the way, there's going to be points at which you get tired, life gets busy or any, any of the X, Y, Z things appear. How did you manage like taking rest periods or no rest periods? Or what was your, your approach on when the days when you ran out of energy, you know what I mean? When, when you weren't so motivated to get up and do those things yeah man look i'm i'm never motivated to do them like just to be honest with you there's nothing on planet earth that brings me more joy than sitting on the couch smoking a joint and eating gummy bears like <laughs> no bullshit like i don't do any of those things now because i decided that my mission is worth whatever effort that it takes to get there now that said you also have to reckon like i know i'm a human being Yes, I have moments where I feel robotic and I go 100 miles an hour and I'll work 100 hour weeks and I'll be a guest on 25 podcasts and do 25 myself and travel to five different states in two weeks and you know go through the chaos of all of that. But when I hit that wall, I think the most important thing is two, two things. One, not getting to the point where you hit the wall because you're cognizant of being within your body. 
one of the things that happens is we get dissociated very easily, right? Our brain, our body, we're just kind of disconnected. And, and I found that in my morning meditation, I'm able to get the most aware of what I need that day. So great example is this morning, you know, I woke up, I did not want to go to the gym. Like it just didn't, it wasn't about physically not wanting to do it. It was about just being lazy. I was like, fuck, I don't want to do that today. And so I dragged my ass there anyway, because I don't negotiate with myself. Like, and that's the thing that I, that I think has held the most true in my life. Like I literally don't negotiate. Like I'm, if I make a decision about something in my life, it is fucking decided. It is as good as done now on the days. Cause I want to be very clear about this on the days where I'm just like, I'm exhausted mentally, emotionally, physically. I listen to my body and I say, what do I actually need today? And if I actually need to rest, then I rest. I do not push myself beyond where I believe that I need to be because that ultimately, that'll send you down a path where you're tumbling, right? And so when I have this conversation with myself and I'm asking myself this question, Am I taking care of myself or am I taking it easy on myself? Because these are two very, very different fucking things. And I've spent a lot of time in my life taking it easy on myself. Dude, trust me, you do not get to 350 pounds because you care about yourself, right? Like there is a tremendous amount of effort that it takes to like mess your life up. But I've come to discover it takes the same effort and energy to destroy your life as it does to build and create your life. And so when I'm in these moments and I'm having conflict about what it is that I need to do, I I go, am I really actually tired? Do I actually need to take care of myself today? Because if the answer is yes, I do it every single time. Great example, Thursday, I woke up, I just felt wrecked. It's been a chaotic week. I run three businesses. I'm always doing stuff like this. I was like, oh, I need a mental break. I messaged my assistant. I said, clear my schedule for a bit. And I went to go see the new Batman movie, right? And and even if that movie weren't out, I would have went to a float tank or I would have went to do, go do yoga class or something in that moment. Or even I would have just sat on the couch and read, right? Just something to relax and take care of my, my physical body. Even like go get a massage because that stuff is so important to me. But that's very rare when I actually hit that wall because I've come to discover that I often, based on my experience of being me, am more willing to take it easy on myself than to push myself. And so it's just about having this massive clarity about what I need in this moment and then not negotiating. Because I find that you know the, the one most difficult thing about this process and this journey is that if you're used to never showing up for yourself and standing up for yourself, which is what I consider it when I, when I push, when I don't want to, if you're used to never having stood up for yourself, then it's the most difficult thing that we do. And so if you can ask yourself that question and just be brutally honest with yourself, like it's okay if you need a day off, like fuck that working yourself to death thing. I'm not about that life. I promise you that's nonsense. I wish we'd make that hustle culture die. It's so stupid. But when I'm like, shit, I'm just taking it easy on myself. I just go push harder push harder, push harder, because I know that that's the only way I'm going to become who I want to be. Gotcha. That makes sense with the um, no negotiating, but also being able to tell the difference between I need a rest day versus I want a rest day. Yeah. So you've got to get massive clarity about what that means because, you know, is it just simply, you know, I didn't sleep well. Is it, you know, there's stress because one of the things like I will do, like if I'm really stressed out, which is pretty rare, I'm like, I'll catch myself reverting or stepping into an old behavioral pattern and I'll immediately have to stop it. Right. And so that, that comes with just getting massive clarity about understanding who you are, causation and correlation and your behaviors. We'll be right back, but I wanted to take a quick moment to tell you about the Think Unbroken six-week trauma healing coaching program. If you go to coaching.thinkunbroken.com, that's coaching.thinkunbroken.com, you can sign up for the six-week daily Think Unbroken Trauma Healing Coaching Program. In this program, we're going to go over the six principles of healing trauma, adaptation, 
understanding the impacts of trauma, how to become the hero of your own story, what to do next, and ultimately what it means to be unbroken. For more information about this six-week coaching program, which you can download as an app on your phone and take with you everywhere, no matter where you are in the world, it's interactive. It's built about giving you practical tools that you can use in real time. And if you're ready for what's next in your life, go to coaching.thinkunbroken.com. Again, that's coaching.thinkunbroken.com. Now let's get back to the show. Got it. Lily, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. We cannot hear you right now. All right. Well, Lily, Lily gets that to, to work. I do have um, another question from Jellybean. She wants to know, what are the other colors of your notebooks? Oh, that's a fun question. No one's ever asked me that before. Um, yellow, blue, and brown. So red, yellow, blue, and brown. So each one of them correlate to something. Red, again, is anger. The brown is actually my goals journal. Um, I use this uh, thing called a monk manual that I absolutely am obsessed with. It's incredible. I love it. It's my favorite journal. Um, the blue one I use for study. Like if I go through a course or a seminar or a program, then I download all of my thoughts into that. Um, and then the yellow one is just kind of like my random day to day stuff, you know? So if I just want to sit down in the morning and like journal, though, I will say this just recently. So I was at an event and somebody was writing on an iPad and so I just apparently have been disappeared from the world. So I had no idea this was possible. And so I just bought an iPad and downloaded this app called Good Notes. And I built in those four journals into my iPad. So I still have that same experience of writing. Um, but I don't like I was literally taking four journals with me everywhere I traveled. And so that said, um, I kind of switching gears here, but i um, doing test run of it right now. Got it. So that answers the colors. Um, another question about how did you make the transition into coaching? And during that process, did you ever go through imposter, sy imposter syndrome? Great question. Um, so the, the, tr the thing with coaching, like, so I'm going on five and a half years of doing it now. It was never a part of my game plan. No, no part of me was ever like, oh, I'm going to go and coach. What happened was I was just writing a blog that was under a different name. It wasn't called Think Unbroken then. It was something else. And I was just writing and, and suddenly people were like reaching out to me and asking me to help them. And I was like, eh, you can probably just go to the library and figure this stuff out. <laughs> and, and one guy was like incredibly persistent about it. And he was like, dude, I'm just going to keep asking you. I'll pay you whatever you want. Just tell me what, what it is that I need to do. And I was like, okay, cool. I will help you. And that's just kind of like, it was literally one person's persistence that got me to where I am now. I've coached and having coached so many people um, and teaching workshops and all those things. Did I have imposter syndrome? Um, not really because the way that I, I was thinking at the time of getting into this, I just said, I'm just going to own it and let's see what happens. Um, I've not really, here's what happened when I was like 27, 28, I realized I didn't have confidence like that, that kind of hit me like a brick one day because I'd only ever been placating other people. I'd only ever been bending to what other people wanted because I felt like if I did that, I would fit in. So great example of that, like no bullshit. I hate country music. Like if you love country music, like respect, I'm not that guy. And one of my friends was like, you should come to this country concert with us. And I was like, okay. And I was there and I was so incredibly miserable. I hate, I hated it so much. And I ended up leaving early. Like, and I was like, I just don't want to be in this environment. And that's when I realized at 26, 27 years old, I was like, wait a second, I don't have confidence to stand up for myself. And imposter syndrome worked itself out through me continuing to show up in only ways that I wanted to in my life. And what happened is I recognized something really important that I think if people will pay attention to what I'm about to say could be very impactful for them. And, and it is this, and this is not crass and this is not ego. This is about identity. I only do what I want to do and I never do what I don't want to do. And so that means agency. 
That means showing up on my terms every single day, not bending myself, not placating myself for the sake of other people. And so as I've gone through this journey, what has happened through being able to leverage that process of only doing what I want, not doing what I not doing what I don't want to do is that I've been able to build confidence and in building confidence, what has actually happened that is really spectacular is I don't give a fuck what people think about me. And so that's not to say I don't value people's opinions and I want feedback, especially if I'm being an asshole. Cause look, I'm a human. I'm going to have that moment. But it's more so in the day to day guys, I get canceled all the time. All like, it's crazy to me. I have hundreds and hundreds of messages of people canceling me for having this conversation of, of, because I curse too much because I'm tattooed because I didn't go to college and I don't, I just go, thank you for the message. Have a great day. There's no, there's nothing worse that, that pisses somebody off when they send you an eight page fucking email than just going, thank you. Have a great day. And so to me, what happened was the idea of imposter syndrome disappeared, I think automatically because I built confidence and I stopped caring about other people's opinion. Awesome answer. Lily, if you want to go ahead and ask your question now. Hi, Michael, can you hear me? I can. How are you? Thank you for this um, talk. Really, you touch everybody here. Um, my question is... Um, how do you deal with forgiveness? Because I, th I see your ability to enjoy life and, and be grateful and thankful for everything that you have. Um, but how do you forgive the people who have hurt you? I have a, um, there's, there's a person in, in my family, and he's about 40, 45 years old. And he cannot forgive the people that he feels that hurt him when he was a child. And this is, this is bringing him a lot of pain and is bringing the people that are around him a lot of pain because he often calls, uh, for instance, he calls his mom and says things like, why did you, you know, and I understand getting a conversation going, but he, ha he, he does this all the time and he's hurting this woman, like leave her alone. She's an old lady and she doesn't need to hear this all the time. I, I spoken to him and I've said what I, what I did with my life was I heard Maya Angelou say, said one time that if you knew better, you would do better. Right. So I tried that with him. It didn't work. What's your recommendation for that? Yeah. Well, look, that's a, that's a hard place to be. And, and I love Maya Angelou and I, I love that quote actually, but the, the truth about it is for forgiveness is to be discerned by the person who needs it. You know, and, and I think that one of the most difficult things is, you know, I look at my life, I'll, I'll give you some context here. You know, I look at my life, the fact that I carry this scar on my hand of missing a finger from my mother. I carry these, these incredible cuts and marks on my body from my stepfather. I carry the, the mental term, term oil of the, just the chaos of the environment that I grew up in. And one day I came to realize something really important. Twofold. One. I think to an extent, forgiveness must be earned. And I think that comes from people changing their behavior patterns and, and showing you that they have done the work to be a better version. Because at some point, you, I, I believe at some point you do know what you should or should not be doing in your life. And so I think that to an extent, there is a level in which forgiveness must be earned. But I also think about this. And, and this has been probably the single biggest driving force in my ability to, to continue to go forward in my life, despite the chaos of the past, is just simply looking at recognizing and acknowledging that I cannot change the past. I cannot do anything about those things that happened to me. I can't, I can't even do anything about five minutes ago. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so in that, what happened was I let go. I stopped wanting forgiveness. I stopped asking for, I stopped having the conversation uh, with it about people who I knew I was never going to get it from. I think about it like this. If you, if you put your hand on the stove and you're burned and then you go and you do it again and again and again, you're torturing yourself. 
Right. And so instead of torturing myself, wanting my mother to be different, wanting my stepfather to be different, wanting them to, you know, seek permission for forgiveness and for me to forgive them or whatever that may be. I said, what if I just let go? What if I just let go? Cause if I let go, that means that I don't have to carry the weight of it anymore. That means I don't have to bring it with me anymore. And in letting go, really, this really beautiful thing happened and I found freedom. I found peace in it because I realized something about those people in my life who hurt me is that hurt people hurt people. And they had been unwilling to do the work and they had been unwilling to have conversations like this and nothing about their life was any different than the day that I was born. And so because of that, I knew they weren't going to be different. They weren't going to be changed. They weren't going to be anything other than who they were capable of being. And in that, instead of me trying to bend them to my world, I decided to change my world in, in totality. And then and, and that peace came. And so, you know, I, I understand where you're coming from because we want people to, you know, learn and understand what we learn and understand because we've seen the impact that it has had in our lives. Exactly. But, you know, you have to also remember people have to want that for themselves. People right. have got to want that. And if they don't want that, you cannot do anything about it. You know, it's the old adage, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And I, I think that applies, especially in mental health. Like, you know, it comes back to what I was talking about a little bit ago about acknowledgement and mm -hmm. about showing up and about be having clarity about what you want. And unless that person says, I'm going to have a lot of acknowledgement about the fact that I'm not going to get this thing that I'm seeking, they're going to torture themselves until the day that they die, hoping that they get that thing that isn't coming. Right. And the the reward is so amazing. That's the thing that, that I don't get. Like the reward for for forgiving is, is, it's not for them. It's for you. You're doing it for yourself. So I am definitely going to send this talk to him. I hope he doesn't hate me. And um, because I'm going to do it from a good place. Like I really want him to, to forgive the people that he feels yeah, but hurt. Lily, that's, what, that's what you want. That's what I you do want. want that. I do want that. Want. I do yeah. want it because he's, want because he's in a, he's in a bad place. Yeah, but he's got to want it. And if he doesn't he want it, it, then you can send him I, you can send him everything, but he's got to decide. Okay, but I'm going to try, Michael, because I think I owe it to him. He's he's a because he's a good man. He, he's hardworking. Yeah. He's a good man. He's a family man. But every every so often he goes into this deep dark place and he starts calling this lady and he tells her how bad he, you know, it all was and it's not it's not a conversation. It's, it's a, you did this and you did that. And, and they're not getting anywhere. Yeah. And, and they likely need professional help between the two of them together, you know? And so I, I would recommend send it to him. And, and if I can support, you can email me at Michael at thinkunbroken.com. I'm happy to help. But, you know, ultimately the one thing I've discovered from coaching thousands of people around the world is they've got to want it for themselves. Right. Okay. Thank you, Michael. I really, really appreciate you, okay? Yeah, thank you for being here. I appreciate you. It means the world to me. Thank you. Take care now. All right, so I've got a question from chat here. Um, it's a little lengthy, so I'm going to read it in the entirety, and then you can answer afterwards. So this is something I struggle with. I've gone through a lot of suffering in my life, uh, abuse, and CPTSD, and live with chronic pain, but I'm not vocal about my trauma. Last night, I was in a group convo. We we're trying to help a friend go through financial abuse. Oftentimes, sharing our experience helps someone else going through the same thing. I also went through financial abuse that is similar to what my friend is going through now because I was trying to, or because I was trying to explain certain angles to get through the mental and tactical challenges of the same situations, but another person kept talking over me because they also went through a different abusive situation and explaining the trauma experience like we didn't understand. I did explain I went through a similar situation as the friend that we're helping, but I think I struggle with the articulation that my question is, how much should we go into explaining our pain so we can help other people in the same situation? Does sharing our story help at all? 
I never want to take away from someone else's suffering because everyone is a unique individual, but I really want to help other people, especially if the situation may be similar to what I went through. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, one of the things that I learned very early on in this journey, and so, you know, you, you look at this from the scope of I, sh I share this really dark story, right? And I share it for purpose because I want to show people that there's possibility on the other side of it. However, what I will say that I think is really important is that I do not share that story uninvited. And so if I'm in a circumstance where there is an opportunity and I, I'm like, hey, I think that I can help you because of this experience that I had, I often will just be like, hey, is it okay? Would you be comfortable if I shared my experience here? So I actually ask for permission first because th the answer may actually be no because sometimes, and especially with our friends and our, our community, sometimes they just simply just want to be heard. Right now, I will say this also, I think there's a lot of context around, you know, time and place and environment for that. I think very frequently that we feel the need to share our stories unsolicited that and they may not actually benefit anybody. And so I often ask myself, why am I doing this and who am I doing it for? You know, when I, I tell people all the time, uh, people will come, especially if you're in one-on-one -on -one coaching and you really get to know me and we're, we're having back and forths at extended periods of time, people will go, well, you know, should I share my story in the way that you do? So I want to be very clear about two things. One, I share my story only so much. You guys know 0.4% of the chaos I actually went through. Some of the things that happened to me in my life will never see the light of day outside of my journal and my therapist. And the reason why is because I don't even want to put that darkness into the world because it's so awful. And the other part of it is looking at and understanding, am I in a position where I have done the work enough that I can share my story without the emotional attachment? Right, I can get on stage in front of 12 people or 10,000 and I can share what I just shared with you all and not have any emotional repercussion of it. And the reason why is because I've done the work. I've went through the process of healing, of growing, of understanding, of making meaning, of being able to build myself to who I am today. And so I can share this story in any platform and never have the emotional repercussion that could come along with it. I learned this the hard way because when I first started doing this publicly six years ago, there were a couple of times when I shared too much, like, excuse me, too much, which I didn't do today where I was like, oh shit, I'm actually, I need to talk to my therapist about this because that thing came up that I haven't dealt with. Now that has given me the ability to really understand that now doing this over six years. But in that moment, like when I, when I think about this a lot, when I'm with my friends, when I'm in a partnership or a relationship, I try not to go into the depths of my story, even if someone is having a similar experience, because I don't know that that's necessarily my role to be played. Right. And I, I think that one of the things is human nature innately, we want to help people, especially if we've been there. But if people are not on the same page and in sync with you about what you want, and this is why I ask permission first, then often it, it may feel to them like you are taking away from that moment of vulnerability that they're offering. And so I would just caution you to, to be willing to just ask for permission first, because you may find that those people actually don't want you to. Now, on the flip side, you may find that if you're like me and you're, you're willing to step into it and carry the torch and you're like, this is the thing that I'm most passionate about, that I'm willing to stand on stages in front of people, even with the potential ridicule and repercussions and judgment and whatever will come along with that, then I, I say that you go through that as long as you've built the right team and the right support and understanding around it. Because I'm able to do this because I've spent tens of thousands of hours and hundreds of thousands of dollars on myself and my personal development. And without that, I wouldn't be able to be here. So I think that's one of the most important things to recognize and understand is whether or not that thing that you're doing is for you or for the person that you're trying to benefit. Gotcha. That was a really good answer to that question. Um, there was another question that came up about your journal. I believe it was called the Muck Journal. Mm -hmm. Can you explain yeah, that? It, like, what exactly is that and how did you come across it and all that kind of stuff? 
So, um, actually one of the people that I've done business with, um, we were talking one day and he, he gave it, gave me a copy and it's kind of just, it gives you the space to write down goals, to write down affirmations, to, to write down thoughts. Um, it's kind of, I mean, there's a million and one journals. I've tried them all. Like I've tried the impact theory journal. Um, I've tried the, um, Brendan Burchard high performance habits journal. Um, I've tried Grant Cardone's journal. I've tried, uh, Mel Robbins journal. I've tried Marie Forleo's journal. Eventually at one point I actually created my own journal. Um, and, uh, then I came across this one and I really loved it. So um, it's just it's just a preference. I don't I don't think there's anything particularly different or special about it versus any other. It just happens to be the one that I like. Gotcha. There is another question. How do you gain that clarity to know the difference between taking it easy on yourself or taking care of yourself? Yeah, great question. Well, I think first off, it's about having awareness of who you are at depth. And what I mean by that is really understanding where you're at in the moment. You know, one of the things, again, I'll, I'll point to is just this idea of just writing and getting the stuff out of your head onto paper. And I, I will find that the most clarity about who I am comes through my writing, through my meditations, through my moving meditations, like being in a yoga class or things like that. And And it's just a practice, right? I think that life is very much a, a day-to-day -day practice and just paying attention, right? Can you be undistracted for a moment? I get the most clarity when my phone is away from me, the television's off, there's no music and I'm just in silence and it's uncomfortable sometimes, especially if I'm dealing with problems in the business or in a relationship, I'll, I'll disconnect. And in that disconnecting, that's where I will find the most clarity because there's nothing else to cloud my mind. That's why like the first hour of my day is so important to me because there's nothing going on except me. And I think that we get lost in that because there's so much content coming at us all the time, but there is real validity in removing yourself from devices, from technology, from television, even from re like, I don't even read for the first 30, 40 minutes of my day. Right. And so just being with yourself long enough to let those things populate, because what will happen is you'll be there. And in that moment, your your body is going to say, no, really, dude, you need to rest today. You need to take care of yourself today. Or it's going to say, no, you're being fucking lazy. So show up for yourself. Now, those are two very different things. And so, you know, I, this morning, again, that example was I'm in my morning meditation. I'm going through my breathing. I'm journaling. I'm thinking about today. And I was like, ah, no, I'll just, I'll work out tomorrow. It's fine. I'll take the day off. But yesterday I took the day off because I was like, I actually really need the day off. And so today I didn't really need the day off. I was just being lazy. And so I said, nope, unacceptable. I do not negotiate with myself. Go to the gym. And, and that's what it came down to is just brutal, brutal honesty with yourself about who you are and about what you want. Because if you're not willing to do that, then you're not going to be able to find that clarity. And I think one of the hardest things that we have in, in our experience, just in general, no matter what kind of background you come from, is that place where, where we're not honest with ourselves and we go, ah, tomorrow, tomorrow. But guess what? Tomorrow may not come. You may not get that tomorrow. We're all going to run out of tomorrows one day. And so it's like, can you show up today knowing that this could be your last opportunity to do it? Now, that's how I push myself in those moments of being like, yo, I'm being lazy. But in the moments in which I'm like, I actually really need to rest. I need a break. I'm going to do exactly like I did on Thursday. And I'm going to take that break. I'm going to remove myself. I'm going to go and do what I need to take care of myself and to recharge. And, and that only, I'm telling you, this only comes to me. And it may come for other people in different ways, but this only comes to me through the silence. And if, if I can't find that silence, if I can't find that space, I cannot find clarity. Awesome. There was another question about the... Um the colors of your journals, uh, they, want, they wanted to go into detail about why each of the particular colors and what that means to you. Yeah, you know, the, the, I think it just because those were the ones that are available when I grabbed them, there, there's no other rhyme or reason to it. Gotcha. And that's just kind of how they unfolded in terms of how you laid them out? 
Yeah, exactly. The The red one, I will say this, the red one did have intention behind it because my therapist was like, you should get a red journal. And so I've been doing a red journal for eight years, seven years, eight years, something like that. But the other colors, you know, the monk journal is brown. I don't get any say in that. The blue journal, it just happened to be blue and the yellow one just happened to be yellow. So, I mean, there, there's really no rhyme or reason to it. Um, maybe that's because I'm a little bit type A. Um, and so I've always used the same colors. And if you look at my journals, they're also color coded with like those post-it note tabs that you can write on the side. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I, there's a lot of organization of those just in case I have an idea. If I'm like, oh, that thing could be a talk or that could be, you know, a, a product for the company or that could be something I need to come back and make meaning of. And, you know, so, you know, I don't here, here's what I would say. I know why people are asking that because, you know, organization may make a lot of sense. But, you know, you can write on a fucking napkin. It doesn't matter. Just, like, get the thought out. Get that thing out that you need to do. I agree. Just got to get it out. But um, another question. So, of course, you have the perspective of going from a very dark place, and now you're living your, your purpose, and you have that clarity. What's it like for you now on a day-to-day to -day – to, or can you explain – can you describe what it feels like for you to be living in your clarity and your purpose? I love that question. Um, it feels fulfilling. It feels, um, it feels very much like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing and there's pride in that. And it feels very much like that knowing, here's what's really fascinating to me. Like, Almost, I mean this, like every single day, somebody emails me and they're like, what you're doing is changing my life. And that serves this incredible purpose for me in, in the continuation of driving through this because building Think Unbroken, coaching, speaking, being an author, writing books, doing the podcast, like there is no question this is the hardest and most difficult thing that I've ever done. But I also think about this as well because I'm so clear about who I am and, and I honor my truth. If I wake up tomorrow and I don't want to do this anymore, even though I'm six years in, I'm not going to do it anymore. Right. And that's, that's one of the really interesting things that I've come to discover about being able to show up and live life authentically every day is that I get to live in my truth. And so I don't hide from myself. I don't lie to myself. I don't bend myself for the sake of other people. And, and that's ownership. And in that ownership has become a lot of beauty and a lot of what I would call um, space to discover and explore. And so w when I live and I look at my life now, you know, again, I, I said this earlier, it takes as much energy to destroy your life as it does to build your life. And in my 20s, I was super successful, right? I'm working for a Fortune 10 company, making six figures, driving an $80,000 car, wearing Sean John suits to age myself again. And I'm living this life totally out of, out of character, out of value, out of anything that I want because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. And now I live a life that's very simple, that's very kind of plain and boring, really, when you kind of look at it from the top down. And I, I do kind of the same things every day. I'm very routine. I'm very habitual. I, I go through the same process in my head before I get on stage or before I record a show and I wear the same clothes all the time. And there's not a lot of flash or glitz or glam to my life, not by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm fulfilled every day. And that's the thing. If you can push towards that, if you can navigate your life towards fulfillment, then you're winning. Because like, you know, when I was making all this money and I was miserable, uh, there was nothing that I enjoyed about my life. You know, there's, there's nothing for me at least, and this has been my experience, there's nothing truly validating about spending money or about hanging out with people who really don't give a shit about their lives. You know, I, I get more I get more out of my life through communities like this, groups like this, having amazing coaches in my life. And, and that is me living life on my terms. And I think that's one of the things that's so spectacular is, you know, I, I sat down, I'll give you a perfect example just because of this community. You know, I, I had Tom Bilyeu come and be a guest on Think Unbroken podcast. 
And I had written down like five years ago, Tom was going to be a guest on my show one day. And so it was just about the process of going through, going through, going through, getting a good show, getting viewership, getting listenership, growing my community, looking at bringing value to impact theory. Like I went to all of Tom's events. I've, I, I do all their products and courses. I've been in decision making. I've been in ITU for like three or four years or something like that. I'm, I'm communal with everyone on the staff. Like I love these guys. Ben's amazing and Will's amazing and, and Amber and, and Amy and Stir and everyone and then Lisa's amazing like and it's like you know I put myself in a position to be successful towards that goal because I had massive clarity I want Tom Billy to be on my show right but I apply that same ideation to everything that I do my physical body my mental body my relationships my friendships I try to create massive clarity around them because if I can move towards that goal I know that on a long enough timeline I can make it happen but I also do this really interesting thing in which I play a mind game with myself. And I always say this, my goals, what I want to build and create in my life are 37 years away. And in five years, they'll still be 37 years away. Right. And it's this thing that I do so that I'm always moving and projecting forward because I've actually come to discover when I've done really, really huge things that I'm like, okay, cool. What's next? And so I try to just continue to move forward, knowing that there's still so much that I want to accomplish. And as long as I want to do it, and as long as it's fulfilling, and as long as it brings value to my life and to the people in my life, I'm going to keep showing up every day. Now, that's a gigantic fucking juxtaposition to I'm getting drunk every fucking night, have a $2,000 a month bar tab destroying my relationships and my friendships, smoking two packs a day and not showing up for myself, right? And so it, it's such a, a very drastic and starch difference, um, stark difference, excuse me, than, than what my life used to be. And ultimately, I'll tell you, if, if I were to summarize this in, in the most simplified way, is I'm living life on my terms and I'm being the hero of my own story. And so that's the difference. I think the perspective is is really key there as well. Because imagine if you've never had those experiences before, it wouldn't you wouldn't be in the place that you are now. Yeah, but, um, and, and also I, I look at those experiences too, and I go, okay, cool. So let me make meaning of those and instead of letting. So in my first book, I wrote a, a line in it that said, "Own your story instead of letting your story own you." And, and that's what happens. And it is perspective. It's looking at those experiences and, and going, yeah, they happen and they fucking suck and it's unfair, but can I still live life on my terms? So there is a, a second question from Kara, but before, before I ask that, I have a quick one that I want to slide in. Do you listen to the Jocko podcast at all? Or are you familiar with Jocko? I've heard you mention ownership a few times. Yeah, I love Jocko. I think he's incredible. I think, you know, the the idea about radical ownership, and, and I, I actually came across him because I, I do run multiple businesses, and so I'm always trying to be a better leader, and I think the first time I heard him was on Rogan, and I was like, oh, this guy is super interesting. And I just started diving into his content and read his books and stuff. And I don't, li I don't frequently listen to his podcast because it's like so long. Um, but on the occasion, um, I, I will check out an episode. But I, I love Jocko. I love what he's doing. Um, he, he's an amazing person. Yep, I would agree. I really like his, uh, his content as well. So a question that we have here is, what if what you want to do is something that's not good for you? And you don't want to do something that's not good for you. Then I don't. I mean, it's just that simple. Like it's because if it's not good for me, why would I do it? Right. Because oh, so let me, let me go through this. Right. I told you my values, honesty, kindness, leadership, self-actualization, no excuses. So when I'm faced with a moment of determining and deciphering whether or not something is good for me, I filter it through my value system. First, it starts with honesty. That's number one. That is always number one. I ask myself, and it's not that I don't fuck up sometimes because I do, I'm human, like I'm gonna be dishonest with myself, but I try my fucking hardest to make sure that's not true. 
And so I, first thing I do is I go through my value system. I go, okay, am I being honest with myself, knowing and understanding that this thing is actually bad for me? The answer is yes, then automatically it's disqualified. And then I go into kindness and I ask myself, am I being a person who is kind to themselves by doing this thing? The answer is no, it's disqualified. And then I go into leadership. Is this thing that I'm doing actually helping me be a better leader or being led, right? And that depends on who I'm looking up to and into the thing. And if the answer is no, it's disqualified. And then the last part is self-actualization. Now, self-actualization is this idea of showing up as who, as who I am every single day. And so if the answer is, if I do this, it will not be authentic and true to who I am. And the answer is no, it's disqualified. Nine times out of 10, all four of those values must be met in order for me to do something. Honesty, kindness, self-actualization, leadership. And so I know that if it's going to hurt me or take away from me, I do not do it. I don't care what it is. I actually turned down an incredibly huge speaking event earlier that potentially could change my career because I was not in alignment with the person who's hosting the event. And their values and my values do not meet. And it felt incongruent for me to show up on that stage. And I know, here's what's fucking crazy. Like I know being on that stage would change my career immediately, but I cannot do it. I cannot allow myself to because of my values. So if you're in this position and you're like, okay, I know this thing is bad for me, then you must be very clear about filtering that through your value system. Because if you don't, then you're going to bend and placate other people so that you you ultimately do that thing. And for me, it's not worth it because I'm going to be awake at night and I'm going to be beating myself up and I'm not going to feel good about it. And I'm going to ask myself, why did you do that when you know you shouldn't have? You know, I think one of the greatest things that I've discovered is not having that conversation with myself where I'm like, I, I don't go back in time. And I'm like, why did I do that? Because I avoid that happening by not doing it to begin with. I would agree. You don't want to make those bad decisions if you know they're bad. So another question, this is one, I think you're going to have a good answer for this one, given how busy you are, but how do you focus on one thing when you have multiple things that you want to do? And for you, I know you have many, you have a lot of stuff going on. So how do you kind of prioritize things in your own life? Control your calendar, control your life. That simple. You know, if you, you, I, I learned this from John Maxwell a long, long time ago, you go look at somebody's calendar, you're going to find out whether or not they're successful. They're, my calendar is dictated in a way that I understand where I am and what I need to be doing all the time. Now, we'll say this. I'm, I'm in a fortunate position where now I have assistants and I have teams, and a lot of it is just me showing up. But in the beginning, it wasn't that. Right in the beginning, it was me blocking things off. So, for example, people, <laughs> this is the funniest shit ever. People always ask me, how do you write a book? I, it's crazy how I, I probably get asked that like five times a week. How do you write a book? And I go, you sit the fuck down and you write a book. Like truly, this is how you do it. But in your calendar, you got to block off that time. You've got to be willing to do that and go, this is the time that I write. This is the time that I coach. This is the time that I'm leading my, one of my teams over in the retail company. This is the time I record podcasts. This is the time that I do speaking events. This is the time I do what go to the gym, right? Whatever that thing is, because then I don't have to like, let my brain think about it. I think it's very much in that same guise of like, when you look at, you know, Steve jobs wears the same shirt every single day, right? That's because it's one less thing that you have to think about. So you can stay focused in the moment. And so if you control your calendar, you control your life. And, and ultimately, it's about looking at um, the priorities around what's in those time frames. So typically, I'll give you a great example. On, on Thursdays and Fridays, from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. all day, both days, I'm only recording podcasts. And every other day, during the work days, unless something, and look, things are going to happen. Interruptions will happen, but I do my best to keep those away from me. I'm not on my phone all day. I don't actually consume social media. My team posts everything for me. So if you guys follow me on Instagram or whatever, or, you know, it doesn't matter, but I'm not actually active in there. My team is. And the reason why is because like I get distracted like everybody else. And honestly, if it weren't for the businesses, I wouldn't even have it at all because I think it's asinine. 
but that's just my opinion. And so having things blocked off, having clarity about things that you need to accomplish in advance, right? Writing down and adding things into your calendar. One of the things I learned that I'll share with you that actually has started changing my business even more over the course of probably the last six weeks is I I did Tom's decision-making business um, workshop. And he talks about this idea of like, you need to know what you're doing with every 15 minutes of your day. And so now even the way that I meet with my team and the way that I I coach people, it's all built around this idea of like, okay, what is the most important thing in this block of time that I can do? But having it blocked off and going, okay, this is what I need to do. This is when I need to do it means that when I show up and it's time to go, I'm ready to go. The other thing that I utilize also, which I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, is called a Pomodoro timer. And so I will set a timer for 25 minutes and I work in blocks of 25 minutes and then I take a five minute break and then I'm back to working 25 minutes. And that's just a rinse and repeat all day long. I also don't let meetings be longer than 15 minutes unless absolutely necessary. Um, I don't let people ask me to pick my brain. Um, I don't let people slack me. Um, I don't, (laughs) you know, there's a lot of things like, like I'm, I don't want to sound negative with all the things I don't do, but the reason I'm able to do so much is because of all the stuff that I don't take place in my life. Gotcha. So that sounds like a very rigid priority system. Well, it has to be because everybody wants your attention all the time. Mm -hmm. so you mentioned the use of a calendar what calendar do you use which do you prefer i just use google calendar same pretty easy pretty intuitive to use yeah and i have like seven emails connected to there so like it's everything just shows up there gotcha so how did you decide what your values are so I was listening, this is before podcasts were really podcasts. They used to just be like streaming shows or whatever. And I was listening. I cannot remember who uh, to the life of me. I've, I've thought about this so many times, but I'm listening to this, this business show. And this guy was talking about values in the business. And he was like, oh, your values in your business should reflect your values in life. And I was like, I don't have any values. Like I've never even heard this concept before. What the fuck are you talking about? And then he just kind of went through it and he was like, look, you've got to go and create these words in your life. You've got to find them. And I just literally pulled up a spreadsheet and I went to dictionary.com and I just started writing words that I thought might represent who I am or who I wanted to become at the time. And they have changed over the years, but for probably the last four years, they've been the same. And And it was just me kind of experimenting and playing and thinking like, is this true about who I am? And then on the flip side of it, once I had those words, and this is actually one of the the workshops that I I teach in in my courses, is once I had those words, I actually defined them for myself. So they they became self-defined because I realized like what one word means to me may not be the same as what it means to someone else. And I wanted to make sure that I had massive clarity about the the power that word holds in my mind and in, in my heart, because I think that words are so incredibly powerful. And if you don't have clarity around the meaning of them for you, you'll get lost in it. And so if you know, if you went and you just adopted all of my values and you're like, okay, suddenly my values are honesty, kindness, leadership, self-actualization, and no excuses. Three of those may not even make sense for who you are and in your life and what's important to you. You may need joy or friendship or power, like whatever that word may may be or may mean in your life. So I think it's really important that you self-define them. And if you, you don't know how to do this, I'll send you the values worksheet that I created for my course. Just email me at michael at thinkunbroken.com, put values up in the subject line and, and we'll have it sent out to you. And it's kind of a base entry level into exactly what I just told you. Because here's how I've figured out how to be a teacher. It's through the same way that I learn. So I learned how to do that for myself. And I thought, hmm, if this works for me, maybe it'll work for somebody else. And then the follow-up question to that is, so once you've got the values that you know matter to you, how did you filter them and put them into the correct order? Like, how did you prioritize which ones are most important? Good question. So 
I, it was a process of also looking at and eliminating some in the beginning and being like, ah, this doesn't feel congruent. It's close, but it's not exact. And then just kind of rinse and repeating that process. Um, and then in terms of order, so the only one that is in order is honesty. The rest of them are whatever order they fall into. But honesty for me felt predominant for two reasons. One, I grew up learning how to be a masterful liar. My, my mother was probably the greatest liar of all time. And she could get us in or out of any situation imaginable. And, you know, we would go out to dinner and we would never have to pay because she would like finagle her way through it. You know, she would, she sued so many businesses. Like she was always just trying to like get over on people. And, and then there was the other aspect of it as well, in which I, I grew up in a household in which I was told these secrets never leave the house. Right. So I'd be a little kid, I'd be covering bruises or I hadn't bathed in days because we didn't have water or, you know, whatever that thing was. And I would just lie all the time. And, and then when I was in middle school, like I was lying so frequently, I had no friends in middle school at all. And that that held true really through most of high school as well. And I just it, it was because it became autonomic to a sense because it was a survival mechanism because I knew if I told the truth when a teacher was like, well, why do you have this bruise on your face? My stepdad would kick the shit out of me. Like the pain I was going to suffer from being honest was way, way worse than the pain that I felt by, by lying. Right. And so when I started to make meaning of that and recognized it, it was very much about, okay, I do not want to be a person known to be a liar. So I'm going to make honesty my number one value. And so in that, whatever that means is that I'm going to do my fucking best to always tell the truth, even if it sucks. And trust me, it sucks sometimes. Like it really does, but it, but it's a must. And so the other words simply came through recognizing and understanding my goals and what I wanted to be and looking at the ideas of what Think Unbroken is supposed to be and what, what it means to you know be a leader in this space and, and recognizing I can't do that without kindness and I can't do that without leadership and I can't do that without living a self-actualized life and I can't do that by making excuses. So the, the rest of the values just kind of came, I don't want to call it serendipitously, but to an extent, yes, because they would just pop in my head. I'd be like, oh, that was the one. That's that's the word that needs to replace the one that doesn't fit here. Um, but, but I think the most important thing that you can do is just sit down and, and just start to identify what feels true of who you are today. And in time, allow the space for those to, to change. Like they're, they're living, like I look at my value system as a living document. Like one day I may wake up and actually be like, you know what? I, I think self-actualization is so true about who I am. That doesn't need to be my word anymore. Maybe my word should be fun. You know what I'm saying? So you, you got to be open to also not being so rigid that you can't be malleable when you feel at your core like it's different. So we had a question from one of the audience members. When are you coming back? Because they would like to hear more. Well, that's amazing. Um, what? Let's connect, and I'd love to come back. It'd be my honor. Um, I love this community. You guys don't understand. Like, I, I haven't said it yet, but six years ago, actually, it's almost closer to seven now. No, six, six. So I was listening to Tony Robbins, and I <laughs> probably not that long prior to that. Um, no shade. I'd be like, "Fuck Tony Robbins." Like I hated personal development. I was like, who are these guys? They're jumping up and down. They're rah, rah. They're motivating. They don't know what I've been through. And so one day that one of my friends is like, dude, you should just listen to some Tony Robbins stuff. I'm like, fine, whatever, man. And so I'm on YouTube and I come across this thing called inside quest. And, and there was this guy, I don't know if I never heard of him before. I didn't even know what quest was, but he had Tony Robbins on it. Well, it turns out as you guys probably know, it's Tom. And, and he opens the conversation with Tony. He goes, I believe we live in the matrix. And I was like, oh my God, somebody else has the same thought that I have. I never, ever heard anybody else say that until that moment. And immediately I was like hooked. And he had the conversation with Tony and I was like, this is fucking amazing. I want more, 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 more. And so 
for me, if I can give back to this community, I will do it as often and as frequently as possible because I'm, I just promise you guys, I would not be here without Tom Bill. You, I told him last week when I was talking to him, I was like, dude, I wouldn't be here without you. And that's true because look guys, we all need mentors. We all need coaches. And, and I'm very fortunate now because I've worked with, with Tony, I've worked with Tom, I've worked with Grant Cardone. Like these people have spoken into my life and in, in these really beautiful ways. And you know, it all started with me just self-educating. And so if I can give myself to this community, I'm more than welcome. So if you guys want me back, I will be back. It's that simple. Absolutely. We can definitely make that happen. And then we can even ask around and see what the next topic should be. Unless you have a topic that you'd like to cover. I know you can talk about business stuff and a lot of other stuff. So we can see, uh, see what the next topic is going to be. Yeah. I mean, I can talk business. I can talk leadership. I can talk, you know, all kinds of different things. And, and all of it is just really kind of, you know, based off of my life and my experience. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm welcome and willing to, to give anything to this community because I'm telling you guys, like whatever Tom's building right now, I still don't think people fully understand this is going to change the world. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm here to show up for it every single day. That's for sure. Love it. So there's a question about your journaling techniques. What do you do to journal uh, or how do you journal to gain clarity? Just write whatever comes to mind. I don't, I don't have any agenda in it. And sometimes it's like, there have been moments in my life where I'm like an hour and a half has gone by. My hand is cramped. Like it's like for real. And I'm like, I got to get this out. I got to get this out. I tried typing as a journal mechanism and I just, it, it felt disconnected to me for a lot of reasons. Um, but most of the time when I'm journaling, I'm just, I'm sitting down. This is after I meditate, after I breathe, I got my cup of coffee there in the morning and whatever comes, comes. I try not to put any parameters around it because then I feel like that's forcing something that may not be true. And so if I sit down in the morning and I write something, it's because it was true in that moment and it wasn't me forcing it into existence. So I think the, the best thing you can do is when you're sit down, don't have an agenda with it because I think you're setting yourself up for failure if you do. Awesome. Well, I don't see any other questions. So we'll give it, we'll give it another couple of seconds. If anybody has any final questions or you'd like to hop on the stage, go ahead and raise your hand and I'll get you up here. But um, just a heads up, if you have not filled out the PO app form, go ahead and do so now. I dropped it in the event room chat. It is going to be closing after the keynote is over. I've not filled out the form yet. <laughs> gotcha. So it is in the chat room, but if you don't get to fill it out, let me know. I can definitely help you out with that. So with that, I don't see any questions. I just want to say thank you for taking the time to to come here and share your your experiences and your knowledge. The chat had a great time. I, I just watching the reaction. Everybody everybody was super impressed with how well you spoke and how how you can convey your story. It was very very interesting and, and very. It was great to listen to. So thank you for doing that. And you are always welcome back. So I have your, your contact information. So we can definitely work that out and uh, bring you back. So thank you. For, yeah. Thank you again for everything. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And thank you guys all for being here too. You know, I, I think something really important to take note of is just by being in this room today, you are putting yourself in a position to be successful. You know, I always look at the people who show up. Because it's the people who show up who are going to be most successful. Hey, Tort, somebody raise their hand. Um, go be awesome. So, you know, I want you to think about that while you're here is you have the opportunity to, to do so much. And all, it really just is so much about just showing up, being in the room, finding a reason to be there. You know, one of the, one of the greatest pieces of advice that Grant Cardone has ever taught me. And look, I know people don't like him and he's fucking polarizing and shit. Like that's fine, whatever. But he, he taught me this. He said, dude, if you can't be in the room at the table, then serve water to the guests. And, and that has held so true in my life. If you're so much of this is just showing up, just being here. And so I want to say also, I'm very, very grateful for you guys because by being here, you're a part of my mission right? By being here, you're a part of Think Unbroken. You're a part of the Unbroken Nation. It, it means the world to me that you guys are all here. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. 
go be awesome. I brought you on stage if you want to get a question. So if you want to go ahead and drop your question in the chat, I'll be able to to read it out loud. Um, but with that, I just want to say thank you again, Michael, for for taking the time and for for coming and for everybody else, for everybody who attended today. Thank you for being here and make sure you fill out the POAP form if you have not done so already. Yeah, this is amazing. And, and Tort, thanks for the opportunity. I love this community. So anytime. No problem. All right. I don't see a question from Go Be Awesome, and I'm not sure if we were able to get that result. Go Be Awesome, uh, like he mentioned, if you want to DM him your question, I'm sure he'll be able to get back to you. But thank you, everybody, for coming, and I'll see you guys again next weekend. Thanks, guys. Take care of yourselves. Be unbroken. Unbroken Nation, hope that you just got a tremendous amount of value from today's episode. I want to know what you think. Please do me a favor and review, rate, and share the episode with three friends on social media today. It would mean the world if you did, because ultimately at the end of the day, creating community and connection is how we heal generational trauma in the world. And I need your help to do that Unbroken Nation. So if you're on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you are, please like comment, share, review. I want to know not only what you like about the show, but how I can make the show better, how I can make this further about helping you on your healing journey. So do me a favor. And when you do shoot me a screenshot of you making the review to my DM at Michael Unbroken on Instagram so that I can have a conversation with you, say hi, and more importantly, so I can share it with the Unbroken Nation. Thank you so much, my friend. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program.